Hey everybody, welcome back to the shop. My name is Adam and this is going to be SNS 105. Alright, so uh, this week we've got some more view appreciation mail and we've also got several entries into the A-Bomb photo challenge there. Uh, several people have started sending in some pictures, so I want to go through and I believe I've got about five, five people to share and some uh, pretty cool pictures there. And uh, yeah, they, they've been coming in I'm, and this is getting pretty interesting. I've been getting a few emails from guys that's requesting the, uh, the, the intro art that they can use in a, in a, in a picture. So uh, if you guys uh, would like that, just uh, send me an email and I will, I'll send you that file so that you can use it if you'd like to. Okay. Um, so I've got some machine work to uh, share with you this week. It's some more uh, footage from work. Horizontal board mill work, and this time we're going to do some more of the uh, key locking insert repair. I, I had a job; it just coincidentally happened to fall right in line with the uh, uh, key locking repair that you already seen me do. If, if you watch that video, I had the one that I had to install, but I had another housing that needed four of them put in there, and I took some footage of that, and it's on the board mill. So let's check it out. I'm going to share it this week, and you guys can see that. And I think next week I'm going to have some um, machining on the board mill uh, facing that big flange. That, it was a big valve that I was working on. I had to do some facing. So we might show that next week, okay? We also got the part two of the uh, brazing job that I already shared, uh, the, uh, the broken casting. And it seems like everybody's been enjoying that video, and I'm, and I'm glad to hear it. I uh, got a lot of good compliments on that. Uh, a lot of questions are raised. got a lot of people still wondering uh, what's better welding or brazen and I just try to be respectful of everybody's opinion and, and let everybody kind of feel the way they want uh, my opinion I like the brazing on on a job like that on a, on a large heavy job that's going to require a lot of heat and I've done a lot of the uh, I won't say a lot but I've done enough of the TIG welding with the uh, cast to know that a lot of times it gives me problems. I get hard spots in it. It, it doesn't matter if I'm using a nickel rod or if I'm using the uh, silicon bronze rod. I always end up getting hard spots in the welds. And when I go to machine it, you, it just causes aggravation because you're tearing your tools up. It's dulling your tools. So brazing provides a very strong joint if it's bonded correctly. And it seems to be a little more flexible than a, than a welded joint. So I like, I like brazing, okay? It's a, it's a personal preference. And I think a lot, of, a lot of people will agree with me, especially the older guys that's, that's done this kind of work for a while. You know, Keith Benner, he, he's done a lot of brazing in his videos as well. And he likes that technique. And it's just, it's just, it's not about what's right or what's wrong. It's, uh, we know it's gonna work. Uh, it's what you wanna do, okay? If you, if you wanna weld it, then that's fine. You weld it, and uh, I'll go over and braze it. That's how we're going to handle it, okay? <laughs> so, anyway, so uh, part two of that's coming out, and and uh, so be on the lookout for that. I also wanted to give one more mention to the uh, the Motion Industries video that I was in last week. I'll put the card up there in the link in the description box if you guys didn't check it out. Uh, if you want to, click the link, check it out. It's like a five and a half minute video where I was guest starring with Tom on uh, the MI How To. And we're just talking about a hydraulic cylinder and, and a little bit of my role as a machinist with uh, where I work, okay? So I know that the people in marketing there are really excited about seeing the views and uh, some people said that they subscribed and they, and they seen those numbers and a lot of nice comments there. So uh, everybody, everybody at work is really excited about that and they appreciate that guys. Uh, they just wanted to let you know thank you also okay so go check out that video and i probably will be in another one here in the future i don't know when it'll be later in the year we'll probably uh do one on a something else that we do in the shop possibly doing it on a gearbox i don't know just kind of throwing that out there so let's go ahead we got some viewer mail some stuff that's come in i want to go ahead and share that with you guys and then we'll get to our uh, our photo challenge pictures okay Okay, our first viewer gift is this nice mini A-bomb sized oil can, a little oiler. It's uh, 
a little push oiler like that. It's got a patent. April, it says April 2395, made in USA. I have no idea really how old that is or who the make is, but it's in great shape. Okay, so the story behind it, okay, so this was sent in by, it was uh, Steve Sedell, and he's from Rochester, New York, and he wrote me a short little note here about this oiler, and we'll read this. Uh, what do you send a guy that has damn near everything and still goes to the flea markets? Well, this. I know how much you love your oil cans. Do you have any like this? Uh, he's referring to my Eagle number 66 oilers. For all you guys that's asked me in all the videos. Cleaned up my dad's basement after he passed and this screamed out to me to send. Steve Sedell. Feel free to use my info on video. <laughs> Alright, so very cool oiler. I do not have anything like that, Steve. So that's pretty unique right there. Um, I would think that's probably for, uh, you know, hobby use or small equipment like you know something on a bench like maybe jewelers lathes or you know i'm thinking small machinery that kind of stuff something that's got little oil cups on it that you want to come in every day and put a few drops of oil in but that's very cool and uh thank you for the for the gift and thinking of me and i'll keep this around i think i'm going to set it right up here on my shelf okay thank you steve Okay, so this is our next gift that was sent in to us, and uh, this was from uh, Greg Halligan, and he's on YouTube as Halligan142, has a, has a cool channel over there. Um, go make sure you check out his channel, he, do, he does some interesting stuff over there as well. So he contacted me and uh, showed me this and, and asked me uh, would this be something that I was interested in. I've never had one of these, we never owned one of these. And I've never got to use one. So this is a geometric. It's a retracting die head, I believe. Let's see. A collapsing die head is what he called it there. And you guys might have seen a video in the past where I used my geometric die head and where you use it to cut external threads. All right, so this one is just the opposite. This works like a tap. So you have dies that go in here and you use those to cut an internal thread and they release so you have this this lever right here you pull that forward and it pushes the dies out and you go in you push in and you do your thread cutting and then you pop the lever like that it retracts the uh, dies and you can pull this back out of the hole so i don't know what size it is the right there where it says the number it's just too far gone there might have been some corrosion on here and Greg said he cleaned this up really well, but I just can't make out what that is, but I'll have to do some measurements. I had a viewer last year send me some pamphlets and some literature on the geometric tools. I've got those inside on my shelf, so I need to pull those out and look through them and see if we can identify what size this, this die head is right here. But uh, thank you very much, Greg, for that. By the way, he did point out that there was, there was one that says um, missing a soft key under that set screw right there let's see okay so we got a there's a key here and what this is this is a this is where you adjust your dies you turn this collar to adjust your dies in or out for your uh for your pitch so there should be a little brass shim up underneath that to protect your threads so we'll have to make one of those for it very cool greg thank you very much and i hope that i can uh, acquire some of the proper dies for this and I'd like to actually like to put it over on the lathe and use it and you know let's let's watch it work okay so thank you Greg okay we got some more cutters here uh, some more viewer gifts and these were sent in by Lloyd LaDuc and he is from Hubertus Wisconsin and what he's got here is some 40 taper shell mill holders with some with some shell mills all right we got a roughing, roughing shell mill right there. I love these things. They just, they have such a free cut to them. You can really do some hogging with these, okay? I showed using one of these on the K&T back during the uh, What's in Your Box of Vice build. And then we have another one here. 
And this is one of your standard plain style uh, shell mills right here. And I don't have my scale on me. I've got one right here though, let's see. So this is a three and a half inch shell mill. You can use it for milling, base milling. Very cool. And then you also had acquired this guy right here. Now this is a spade drill. So this would be for an uh, inch and a quarter cut. You have to order the, the spade bits and put it here in the end. It takes the coolant. So you can use a flood coolant down through the center of it. So what he had said was in his letter here, he had bought a, a 5C collets, a set of 5C collets at an auction. And he says all these tools were included in that auction. And he, he had no need for them. He doesn't have a mill, which he hopes to uh, buy a mill here pretty soon. He does have a Logan lathe. And, uh, but anyway, he just, he said he wanted me to have these, so he sent them to me. So thank you very much, Lloyd, for, for these. Um, you know, I bought a couple of these recently to go for the KAT, and I got them right over there. So these are gonna go with the stack of cutters. Unfortunately, I can't use the 40 taper here but I can use these at work. The Acra mill that I've shown used many times there on video um, uses 40 taper tooling. So I think these could be used down there, okay? So thank you very much. I really appreciate it, man. All right, so let's go ahead and get to our A-Bomb Photo Challenge uh, contributors. So we're gonna go ahead and start with Lee and Nick Stackhouse. All right, in these pictures, we're taken at the original Woodstock Festival, I'm sorry, the, the site of the original Woodstock Festival at Bethel, New York. He said this is four miles from their home and their shop. And today it is the site of the Bethel Woods Performing Arts Center in Woodstock Museum. And he also threw in uh, a couple wrenches he said I could use to fix a watch if I wanted. <laughs> so those are pretty cool right there. Thank you for uh, sharing those, Lee and Nick. Our next picture is from Greg Sturk. And this is a shot that he took in Moab, Utah. And he said the location is known as top of the world and it has a vertical drop of 3,275 feet. And he, he asked me, uh, overheard that, uh, that I like the, the Southwest, which I had mentioned I've always had a, a just a special place in my heart for the American Southwest. I've never been there, I've never traveled there. I, I flew over it when I went to California, but I always enjoy seeing that part of the country, especially when it's on TV or in movies. I was a huge fan of Breaking Bad, and they uh, they filmed that out in Albuquerque, and I always liked seeing the scenery from that show there. But uh, anyway, Greg, that's a cool picture there, where uh, you know you, you got my logo there on the cliff side, and, and it looks like you're having some fun there. So thanks for sharing that. All right, so our next picture, and this is Nick Sturchok. And he is from, let me see how you pronounce this. I had to ask him. Oneonta, Oneonta, New York. <laughs> That's where he lives. But uh, he's standing in front of the National Baseball Hall of Fame Museum in Cooperstown, New York. And he's holding his A-bomb size shirt. So that was one of the t-shirts he bought from the campaign that I was running there. And uh, he enjoys watching the videos every weekend. And he's also, he says here, he is a brother to, a son of, and grandson of machinists that have and still work in the same plant. So uh, he actually helped do some of the uh, the surveying work at the museum there a few years ago. So, Nick, I really appreciate your entry there, man. Cool picture and looks like a nice, neat place to go visit. All right, our next photo entries here. And this is a, this is another one I, I was kind of having a hard time pronouncing, but I think I finally figured it out. So this is from Shord Kelchens, and he is from Finland. Actually, he's from the Netherlands. But the pictures that he's sharing right here, he's in, he's in uh, Juca, Finland. And what's really interesting about this is that, uh, now he said that whenever he took these pictures, he didn't have my logo at the time. This, this was before the, uh, 
the challenge has started. But he took these pictures. And what he was a part of right here is a, a team of, of students that were challenged to build a large ice bridge. And he sent me a long email explaining how all this works. There's, there's a few things that get involved here. Uh, one, in the picture there with my logo, they use basically a giant balloon. They blow that up and then they start spraying the ice over the top of it. And, and it, so that creates the arc there and the, the dome of the, uh, of the ice bridge. And then once it's uh, set, then they remove, the, uh, they remove the balloon from underneath it. And he was also telling me that the, uh, the ice is actually, it's a mixture, uh, contains uh, what cellulose. So it's 98% water and 2% cellulose, a uh, kind of paper, and it makes it three times stronger than normal ice. And uh, also, he had mentioned here, I'm looking at his email, I thought he mentioned how cold it was here, but maybe, maybe that was somebody, oh, okay. Minus 34 degrees Celsius. That's how cold it was in that, where he was uh, working on that bridge right there. So, very cool uh, project. Sure, that that's uh, that's something pretty interesting right there, man. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. So it looks like you had some fun, and it looks like it might be a little bit too cold for me there. All right, but uh, thank you for the pictures. I enjoyed sharing them. All right, so this is going to be the last photo entry of the week, and this is Brad Lilly. Uh, some pictures that he submitted here and this is all the way up in Nova Scotia, Canada and it's at the Annapolis Royal Generating Station and it's the only uh, power generating station by tidal power in the North America so it uses the power of the ocean tides to generate power and he's got a picture there with my, uh, my logo so that's pretty cool. I had no idea that that even existed. He did share a, a, Wiki, a Wikipedia link there for me to check it out, and it kind of explains a little bit more about it there. But very cool, Brad. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you sending them in. All right, guys, what we got here today, we're on the bore mill, and we've got a um, rotary actuator here that is um, uh, driven by uh, hydraulic fluid. You have a you have a piston on each side. It's basically like a rack and pinion. So you have a shaft here with a spur gear and you have a rack with a piston attached on each side. And so you have uh, fluid power that rotates the shaft. But what we're gonna do today is repair these threaded holes here. They're stripped out. These two are stripped out and these two are questionable. So we're gonna do all four. And we're gonna use these uh, key locking thread repair inserts that's one of them right there so what we'll have to do is center up on our holes and I've got a bolt made that uh, I chucked it up trued it put a center in the end and I'll actually screw that in there and then we'll find the center of the bolt and then drill it tap it and install our uh, key locking thread inserts okay uh, this is 3 quarter 16 and we're gonna have to drill and tap it to inch and an eight 12 for the uh, these external threads okay so I'll show you how we do that along the way all right we're gonna go ahead and get the first hole indicated I've got the bolt screwed in pretty tight it's it's run up in there pretty good ways there and then I'm gonna use this coaxial indicator with the uh, spring-loaded center hooked into it And I don't think I've ever touched on this before. I know you can run these things, you can spin them and adjust it that way, but I've never liked the feel of doing it that way. I like rotating it with my hand. It don't matter where it's at here or on the other milling machine and dialing it in. I just, I have a hard time following that needle and moving them handles and getting it dialed in. I just like, I like doing it the slow way, which is this way to me, okay? I just make small movements until I get it about where I want it. And 
can get this thing within a couple thousandths. It should be plenty close enough. So I'm gonna call that one good where it's at. That's that's within two thousandths right there. Alright. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get the hole drilled. We're going to use an inch and a sixteenth drill bit. I've already chamfered it. I like to always cut a chamfer before I drill it to help help the drill follow the hole a little bit better. Okay. Even though we're getting a pretty good string, that's actually cast iron that we're drilling. Alright, we got the hole drilled, so we're going to go ahead and uh, chamfer, chamfer the edge now. I'm using an 82 degree uh, single flute. Alright, that should be good. Go ahead and tap the hole. I'm going to use the, the uh, anchor loop for this. I do like using a little bit of anchor loop for cast iron. I've had problems with uh, sometimes tapping cast and once the gall, especially pipe threads, and this seems to do the trick right here. It's not cutting oil and it's water based, so it gives it a nice little bit of lubrication as it's cutting. You don't need a lot of it though, just a little bit. I'm just going to put a little bit right there and a little bit on the tap. And also, we got a choice. We can use my Greenfield number seven, or we can go with the card number 10. Let's try the card. But you guys don't ever get to see too many other big boy handles. <laughs> I'm gonna use a spring-loaded center. makes tapping that much easier man having the big leverage here see if one of these will fit. Sometimes you got to come in here and do a little bit of hand filing because the threads, these things get banged around on each other and sometimes it'll be a little stiff to go in the hole. Yeah, this one's trying to be a little bit stiff, but it's going. Sometimes I take my scale, you know, multi-use tool. And as long as it's not tight, you can use that as leverage on the keys there. Get it 
just below flush. Okay, all right, we're good. So I uh, need to go get a hammer and we'll, uh, we'll draw these pins in here. All right, that's where you take your little install tool that comes with the kit and stick it on there and you just take a hammer. Uh, you guys remember that? That's it, you hit the four keys pressed in and that ain't coming out of there. Should have a, uh, a good, good threaded hole now. Oh yeah, nicely repaired hole. So we'll go ahead and move over to the next one. All right, so here's how I kind of get it close. I got a pointer, uh, a center. I use that also for um, holding the back of a tap handle or something like that. Or just uh, finding lines on scales, on rules, and uh, find center points. So move it over, and I use that to get it close. there I'll go with the uh, uh, coaxial and find the center. We're going to go ahead and drop the head of the mill down to the next hole and there's a couple things I'm going to do here. I'll show you. I got a travel dial up here on the top. We don't have a readout on this, but I got a travel dial up here. So I can follow that to bring me down center distance on this and then I'll indicate it, make sure it's there. But I'm going to go from the you know top edge of the hole to the top edge of that hole and it looks like Maybe it's a five and three quarter center to center distance. So I got the travel dial on zero and we'll follow that and drop it down. Okay, here we go. We got zero. This one will go to uh, six inches total. Um, I believe that's a uh, hundred thousandths per line. And then of course this shows you your hundred thousandths per revolution. All right, so this is after the drop. Got my pointer in there. Let's see, let's go ahead and bring that thing to me. Uh, 
it looks like it's dead on it. I'll go ahead and check it with the indicator though. Just a few thousandths out. All right, there we go. I'm gonna leave it there. I had to switch to my Greenfield number seven because the card was too big to swing here. That's okay though. All right, guys, that's it for this uh, this repair. This is all I got to do the four holes. And you see how simple it is to, uh, to use those. And I feel that that actually provides a better job in many cases versus a Healy coil. Uh, just a solid threaded plug there. But yeah, this unit's ready to go. Uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna test it now and then they'll repaint it and send it back to the customer. So that's it. Hope you enjoyed.